Today we're revisiting the GTX 1080 and the greatest video card that NVIDIA ever made, the GTX 1080 Ti. Ti. What, was, what was that? Not only did the 1080 Ti come out at a time when it was just the Ti and not the Ti, 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 Ti. or the Ti Ti, or the Super Ti, or the Ti Super, all of those came later. It was, they innovate in different ways every time. It was also the greatest card that NVIDIA has ever made. And we've regularly said it's a mistake that they probably won't make again. This card is the GOAT. Absolutely no questions about it. And it's actually why I still have a 1080 Ti in my personal system at home. It's actually an SC2 ICX model uh, that I liked when we reviewed it, and now it's retired from service and in my machine. So it's good enough that depending on the games you play, especially if you don't play RT or something, they can still handle it. And they're seven years old. The 1080 Ti is such a good card that we have now revisited it at least two or three times, maybe more. I've lost count, uh, and Google has gotten worse as a search engine. But we've revisited it a lot, and it's worth doing again because now there's the whole Super Series, the 700 GRE, basically everything has launched for this generation, in theory anyway. Uh, and so we can take a complete look at where it stands today and what your options are. Uh, and also for this revisit, we have a couple new types of charts just to try and capture the most relevant things as fast as possible for those of you who might still be on one of these cards. And if you're not on one and you just wanna look back at something that was impressive for its time, maybe this will give a new perspective as to why. Before that, this video is brought to you by Montech and the King 95 Pro case. The King 95 Pro is a dual chamber enclosure with configurable options for storage and power supplies. The K95 has a deep 35 millimeter cable channel for management, support for dual power supplies if you want it, which could be useful for a thread ripper system, and ample radiator and fan mounting options scattered around the top, back, bottom, side, and front of the case. The front also can be mesh or solid, with the mesh running a higher porosity for more breathability. Learn more at the link in the description below. One of the things that made the 1080 Ti so good was that it was typically about $100 more than a GTX 1080. Maybe 200, depending on which price you're looking at. That was an era where Nvidia was experimenting with having two launch prices because uh, we needed that in our lives. They've improved in that respect at least, but typically it was a one to $200 price jump between the 1080 and the 1080 Ti. And given the performance gap, which we'll look at in a moment between these two for the first time against each other in years, actually, we haven't tested them both on the same charts in a while, it really made sense to go for the 1080 Ti for people who could afford it. The RTX 20 series launch, though, is really what cemented the 1080 Ti in its place as the greatest of all time. The launch of the RTX 2080 saw us telling everyone to just buy a 1080 Ti instead. That's because they could still be had for, believe it or not, around $700 at that time, which made it often 100 bucks cheaper than the average 2080, maybe 50, if $50 cheaper if you bought one of the cheaper 2080s. Uh, and it was extremely competitive. The MSI Armor series was a bare bones, kind of garbage tier cooler for the 1080 Ti as far as that generation of coolers went anyway, but it was a, an MSRP option at 700 bucks that we liked because you got a good enough VRM, you could strip the cooler from it, didn't feel like you were throwing away a ton of cost in it, uh, and then throw a hybrid cooler on it, like a CLC with a VRM fan. That was really popular for the era. You suddenly had a very budget conscious, water cooled, cold enough to overclock 1080 Ti. And that's another aspect of what made these cards so damn good. The power for vBIOS gave you more headroom to overclock than you'll find on a lot of modern cards today. But the real reason the 20 series set the 1080 Ti up for such success was because it launched with no namesake feature. It was called RTX. There was no RTX. It was about two months before the first RTX game launched. Uh, I remember talking about it in news segments where we were like 55 days without RT title. Uh, and at the time, that was when RT, real time RT was still kind of a, a new thing being marketed. It hadn't proven itself. And there's no reason to review or buy a product based on a promise. And so when the 1080 Ti was matching or sometimes exceeding a 2080, uh, and it was often cheaper, it didn't make a lot of sense to buy a 2080. And it would be years before RT became really truly meaningfully relevant in any at-large way. So the 1080 Ti immediately, if it didn't already have it, gained legendary status with the launch of the 20 series. 
the pricing was a big part of that, where the 20 series saw the 2080 Ti coming in at 1200 bucks or whatever it was, plus or minus a little bit. Uh, and that just felt like such a climb compared to this card that whatever status it had not yet earned, the 1080 Ti, it earned with the 20 series launch. So uh, this still, even seven years later, and uh, close to eight years later for the 1080 non-TI, which is also worth talking about, can still handle a lot of games. It can still play at a reasonable FPS in non-ray traced scenarios. You lack some modern features. You don't have RT hardware. There's kind of limited natively supported upscaling options. So it has limitations and it's starting to show age, but depending on what you play, you might not even need to upgrade it. And if you're ready to upgrade, at least it is a massive jump from seven years ago. That's some pretty damn good mileage out of a video card. Some additional history here. The 1080 Ti launched in March of 2017, about a year after the 1080's launch in 2016. It was a powerful one-two punch for Nvidia. At the time, its newest competition from AMD for the 1080 Ti would have been the RX 580, which launched in April of 2017, and that itself was just a refresh of the 480. Otherwise, the 1080 Ti was up against an aging generation of Fury cards. Vega wouldn't come out for another several months after the 1080 Ti's launch, and largely to disappointing reception. And this is part of what we're trying to do today. We've revisited this card so many times from a performance aspect. Today it's about providing some extra provenance and background, especially for people who hear about the 1080 Ti. You see people say it was legendary, it was the GOAT, not sure why. We're trying to give some of that context, and I still remember covering all of this as it was happening, because it was an exciting time. Uh, this was an era where AMD was absolutely plagued and riddled with driver problems. We had multiple videos on them back then. I remember posting one that was titled something along the lines of like, AMD sabotages itself again or something like that. And we talked about drivers all the time for them. So Nvidia was in an overpowering position uh, and AMD's drivers at the time were so riddled with bugs that if the drivers had a door, opening that door was like opening the door to a roach infested room where you just see them all scatter. AMD's drivers though have gained substantially since then. That era is largely gone for AMD. They fixed those problems. It's nothing like it used to be. So huge improvement from AMD's side of things and its modern generation of cards is much more competitive than what it was fighting with back then, which before Vega launched, wasn't a lot, at least not a lot of brand new architecture stuff. Uh, and so at that time, AMD mostly chose to fight in the mid-range market. They had $200, $250 RX 580s, which looking back was actually a pretty damn good card. And even at the time, I think pretty much everyone recognized it as the best mid-range option in a lot of cases. And uh, that market is kind of dead today, which is sad. We maybe took it for granted at the time where we had the 1080 Ti, at the top end as an inarguable best. And we had things like the RX 580 keeping that affordable class alive in a way that today, you don't really get that type of competition until you go up to 400 bucks or so, maybe 500, uh, where you really start to see the market get interesting. So it was a, a much different time for the market and GPUs and the prices were a lot different. Let's go over that quickly though. So we have some price data with inflation adjustment. The GTX 1080 Ti was often $700 like with the armor card and it ran up to 800 pretty frequently. There were more expensive cards as always, but these two price points cover the vast majority of relevant options. Today, a $700 purchase of the 1080 Ti would be equivalent to spending $880.73 according to US inflation data. An $800 purchase would be equivalent to $1,006. If you look at GPUs available right now, that $880 adjusted price would be an RTX 4070 Ti Super from Nvidia or an RX 7900 XTX from AMD, flanking each end. The $1,000 inflation adjusted 1080 Ti price, if you bought it that higher end back then, would be an RTX 4080 Super's MSRP, if you can find one at MSRP, or again, a 7900 XTX. Back to the inflation table, the GTX 1080 was $600 to $700 commonly. And again, remember that Nvidia made this all very messy with its FE pricing at the time. We're kind of ignoring that aspect. That'd be a $766 to $894 price in inflation adjusted today. Equivalents would again include the 4070 Ti Super from Nvidia or the 7900 XT up to maybe the 7900 XTX from AMD. What's wild is the used price of the 1080 Ti. In a quick look around, they seem to have sold listings on eBay for 150 to 200 bucks or so, and sometimes cheaper if you buy one with a broken fan, which is an easy fix. 
That makes a used 1080 Ti a better option than NVIDIA's modern $150 to $200 video cards, or sometimes even its $300 card if you're willing to sacrifice RT. So in a way, NVIDIA's own masterpiece remains kind of a thorn in its side to the extent that at a launch event, Jensen went on stage and he said something about, To all my Pascal gamer friends, it is safe to upgrade now. And that was because of cards like this and the 1070. The 1060 was fairly competitive too. Now the 3080 did really well to reset the whole pricing stack. Following the 2080, it felt like a breath of fresh air. It was lined up to be another 1080 Ti in terms of its reception, but the rug got pulled out from under it because of the immediate boom where it was no longer available. And when it was available, they were scalped and way overpriced. So that kind of killed the momentum on the 3080, but it was kind of lining up. Still though, nothing has quite touched the 1080 Ti. So let's get into some numbers. We'll start with reestablishing our bearings for how the 1080 and the 1080 Ti compare to each other today. This factors in the latest drivers for each, the Windows updates that are the latest, and modernized changes to the BIOS, firmware, things like that, the OS as well, such as rebar, hardware accelerated GPU scheduling. Here's the chart. This shows percent improvement from a 1080 to a 1080 Ti in the various games we test in 2024. It's remarkably consistent from game to game in this era, even across resolutions. That's a big difference from what we see with cards today, where Nvidia in particular plays with memory bandwidth in ways that create less predictable or at least less linear scaling across the resolutions. The GTX 1080 Ti is generally about 35% faster than the 1080 in average FPS for today's benchmarks. If you had waited until the 1080 Ti launched, and spent about $100 more, max maybe around $200 more than the 1080, then that money stretched out pretty well and could have been a deciding factor in stretching the card out for maybe one more generation. As a side note, it's rare that we see something like 38% uplift within a single vendor stack for a hundred bucks today. It doesn't really happen anymore. And the few times it does happen, they're pretty rare. Uh, broadly speaking, looking at the consistency of improvement of those numbers, for the price at the time, again, something like 100 bucks, maybe 150 sometimes, it just, it seems like it will never happen again. And like it was almost a mistake. Okay, on to the next table. Since we've recapped the 1080 Ti so much, again, we're experimenting with some different charts. This is a different one where uh, we're using a simple table that recaps several games we've tested in one shot. But what it does is uh, in the first column, it's gonna show you the most immediate trailing card. So the one that's the most comparable to the 1080 Ti, but right behind it. The other column shows you the most immediate advantaged card ahead of it. The middle is something roughly equal. Now, all three of those together, because it's immediate, immediate, and then roughly equal, you end up with basically what is the equivalent today? That's what this table will answer. And it serves to help you get a, a sort of quick snapshot of your minimum threshold you want to clear to actually get a meaningful upgrade. Ideally, you go a little bit beyond that too. This also helps you figure out a baseline. So this part's important where uh, going forward, if we or other reviewers drop the 1080 Ti from charts, but you want to know where it falls, you look at this list of equivalents. And then in the future, if you know it's roughly equivalent to card X and the 1080 Ti is not on someone's chart, you look for card X and you go, okay, it's probably around here. It's not perfect, but it's good enough to kind of keep it in, keep it fresh with knowing where it lands. Here it is. The most immediately behind modern architecture GPU is generally the 6600, 6600 XT, or Nvidia's 60 class cards like the RTX 3060 and 4060. Intel Arc also makes a few appearances. And this tells you that if you wanted to upgrade, you would need to buy at least better than these cards in a modern lineup to get any meaningful improvement at all. And ideally you'd go a couple steps up from them to ensure it actually is meaningful and not just basically a side grade with ray tracing capabilities. The closest of any generation we've recently tested is variable here. We see that the 2070 Super makes an appearance a few times and the 7600, but it really depends on the game tested. The 2080 also makes an appearance in that column. For the most immediately advantaged modern generation card, the 1080 Ti is commonly beaten most immediately by the same cards as were immediately behind it. This makes sense because when a card is plus or minus a few percentage points, it'll sway in either direction depending on the game. The 4060 appears the most here. If you're not buying at least a 4070 or a 6700 XT as a replacement, generally speaking, we don't think it'd be worth buying a new card. If you can do it, it's maybe more sensible to save up a little longer if possible 
and buy something another click or two up. Let's look at this another way. Instead of looking at the immediate flanks, since that largely comes out to be the same set of cards sort of across the stack, we're going to look at the most likely upgrades for a quick snapshot. And for this, we're looking at similar pricing inflation adjusted. So in other words, someone who wants to spend a similar amount of money in value back then today, what might you get for uplift? That's what we're looking at. And we have some others that are a little bit lower in price. We're going to go through as well that are maybe more similar to like to like back then. Uh, and we'll talk about more of that with the 1080 also. This also helps you understand what the difference between $150 or $300 extra might get you uh, if you're upgrade, you're buying a new card today, what's that gap look like if you spend a little more? Here it is against a bunch of games. The 1080 Ti itself is not shown. That's because it's the left axis or the baseline. We're looking at percent improvement over baseline and average FPS. This is one of those scenarios where anything would be an upgrade. Generally speaking, you can expect somewhere around a 120 to 150% uplift or so with a 4070 Ti Super just looking across this suite of games. The 4080 Super, roughly speaking, would be around 170 to 190% uplift. The XT is around 140 to 160% for uplift with the XTX at 190 to 210% or so, just broadly speaking. Each of these has several breakouts, including the 7900 XTX in particular, spiking upwards of 300% improvement in Starfield. Uh, at that point, percentages don't really feel like they mean anything anymore. So suffice to say, it's an entirely different experience. You should basically be choosing between the modern cards that you're considering rather than necessarily comparing them to the 1080 Ti because all of these are going to be massive changes in the experience but it's still fun to look back and get a feel for it this way. The next recap is for the GTX 1080 non-TI. For this one, we're comparing against the 4070 Super, the 4070 Ti Super, the RX 7900 GRE that just got a global launch, and the RX 7900 XT. The 4070 Super is the same price that the 1080 launched when ignoring inflation, or it would be the equivalent of $470 at launch, like back then. The 7900 GRE is a similar price today, or including inflation, would be about $431 back at launch. And that gives us two cards priced similarly with inflation and two priced below. Here's the chart. The 1080 Ti doesn't appear here since we've already shown a summary chart for that. But as a reminder, that generally be around 35% uplift from the 1080. For the rest, you can get increases in average FPS in the multiples, even with something at an equal price today when ignoring inflation. In other words, even if your buying power hasn't kept up with inflation, you can at least get a 2 to 3x increase in many scenarios with the 4070 Super. The 4070 Ti Super is better enough that it may help pull you forward another year than the 4070 Super, though that depends so much on how much you're willing to lower the graphics settings, what games come out, that it's hard to really make estimates like that, but uh, you're paying for that theoretical longevity. The 7900 GRE also provides significant uplift while being cheaper than $600 and is one of the more relevant cards at this price point right now. The 7900 XT is just in a completely different class of rasterization performance altogether. Uh, it blows these away. The biggest difference, though, would be in ray tracing, where you're going from basically not compatible to compatible on any of these modern devices. Now we're about to get into the individual game tests just to give some foundational data with more charts. but. Uh, ray tracing kind of remains the key point here that doesn't get charts because the 1080 Ti does not natively or meaningfully support ray tracing, uh, real-time ray tracing with modern games. So because of that, there's not really anything to test. It's your number is basically zero at, or at, unplayable enough to be zero if you were to force it in some scenarios where you can. And so for ray tracing results, just look at our 7900 GRE review, any other recent review, look at the RT chart, that gives you an idea, but you're not really choosing between how much better is it than a 1080 Ti, uh, because it might as well be infinitely better. Okay, we'll quickly run through some game charts, but because we've already covered the major comparisons here, it's not a lot more to talk about, we'll make this quick. You can pause these if you want to check out cards that we haven't explicitly mentioned, uh, otherwise we'll focus on the key highlights. In Final Fantasy 14 at 4K, the 1080 Ti still manages to hold the 62 FPS average, so no problems here. That has it at 3060 Ti levels of performance and actually surpassing the 2080, somewhat embarrassingly for the Touring card. The 1080 FTW ran at about 7600 levels of performance, flanked by the two available models, and this chart actually also contains an overclock we ran for the 1080 Ti last year when we did a different revisit, and that data is still valid for this game because the results for this title don't change with our test approach. So that OC had it up at about 6700 XT average FPS, 
surpassing the 4060 Ti. In Dying Light 2 at 1080p, the GTX 1080 sat below the 6600 in our most recent round of testing. The 3060 also leads it somewhat significantly. The 1080 Ti has done excellently to hang on here, but in some heavier modern games, it's beginning to fall to the bottom of the charts. Of note, even Intel's A750 is outdoing the 1080 Ti in this one. The RTX 3080 is another good reference point, about 151 FPS average to the 1080 Ti's 74 or the 1080's 55. One last note, you can see the 1% lows dip down on the 1080, indicative of where some of the generational improvements have been invested over the years. 1440p stretches the scale to the point that the 1080 Ti now falls below 60 FPS, so if we choose 60 FPS as a somewhat arbitrary line of scrimmage, the first card that passes it is the A770 on this chart, with the 7600 XT and the 2080 close enough. For non-Intel, you might consider the 4070 or the 7800 XT as meaningfully improved with the 1080 Ti, but probably with less staying power than you benefited from the 1080 Ti, and realistically, the 4070, uh, if you're coming from at least just a naming perspective, feels like a, a more of a step aside or a step down even than the original 1080 Ti purchase, but it's still objectively better. And Starfield at 1440p tested mostly because it helps us avoid non-GPU limitations higher up the stack at, say, 1080p, the GTX 1080's performance had it about tied with an Intel A750 GPU. Intel struggles with Starfield, so it's not the best comparison, and so we can instead turn to the 6600 and the RTX 3060, which both post large gains over the GTX 1080, despite neither being a recommended path forward from this card. This and the 1080 Ti alike would be hugely improved upon by nearly anything in the chart. 1440p is heavy with this game on these cards. They were capable 1440p players at the time, and even some 4K, but games have also gotten heavier in the years since Pascal. At 4K, the Pascal cards really just can't handle the game. They're clearly struggling. Their results are less consistent as a result of this load. Fortunately, not much was lost because it's Starfield, but to get any meaningful uplift might mean a jump to a 7800 XT, uh, a used RTX 3080 as a great option, or the 4070 Super. In Rainbow Six Siege at 1080p, we're served a reminder that both of these cards can still be objectively capable performers for the right title. This combination of resolution and game still puts the GOAT 1080 Ti into the hundreds of FPS average approaching 300 actually, with even its slower 1080 counterpart still surpassing 200 FPS average. If you're not playing the heaviest games at higher resolutions, and if you don't always need the max settings, then in an objective sense, these are still good enough. And this is a great reminder of that. Anyone ultra competitive in a game like this might notice a latency difference between the 1080 Ti and the 4070 Super here, but generally speaking, if you're not noticing the performance of your 10 series card as being bad, then there's no shame in sticking with it. To us, it's a sense of pride. That's actually why I still have my 1080 Ti in my home machine. At 1440p, the GTX 1080 still holds 130 FPS average in Rainbow Six Siege, with the 1080 Ti continuing to impress and earn its GOAT title. All seven years later now, we're still seeing performance equivalent to a 2070 Super in this one, and besting the modern A750. Noteworthy entries on this one remain the RTX 3080, which would still give a huge upgrade pathway while potentially running cheap if you're willing to trust the used listing. The new RX 7900 GRE also jaunts ahead for something at a balanced price. At 4K, the Pascal cards both managed to keep their frame rate above 60 FPS. The 1080 Ti FTW3 held an impressive 83 here, tying it with the 2070 Super and the 7600 XT. And the 1080 FTW ran at 62, about the same as the 6600 XT. They're still hanging in there. Another option we haven't discussed is a potential used 3070, but it'd really have to be cheap enough to be worthwhile. Other cards probably feel a lot better to move to than a 3070 if you're a current 1080 or 1080 Ti owner, uh, if only from the sort of psychological association with the naming. It feels like a downgrade. If you can get a 6950 XT for 500 bucks or so, that's another one that people are probably sleeping on these days. Resident Evil 4 at 1080p is up now, another one of the relatively new titles in the suite. This one has the 1080 Ti at 101 FPS average and the 1080 at 74. It's not bad. The 1080 Ti puts up a performance not distant from the 2080, just ahead of the 2070 Super, and the 1080 trails the 3060 here. So this is still playable on both, though. At 1440p, the 1080 FTW slips to about 50 FPS average. Still playable, but less enjoyable. Enjoyably. The 1080 Ti maintains an overall good frame rate and is effectively tied with the RTX 4060. You'd want to buy into a higher class of card of upgrading, 
Uh, otherwise, it'd just be the same in rasterization, except with RT support for less intensive RT titles. On the AMD side, the 6950 XT remains worth paying attention to in the used market, as does the 3080 for used. For new cards, the 7900 XT remains hard to beat for its value, with its $700 pricing these days, or up to $720 or so. And for Nvidia, the 4070 Super might be one of the stronger modern values. At 4K, both cards struggle. They fall off more as resolution increases in these modern games. The 1080 Ti manages to hang on to 2080 equivalents, reminding us of exactly why our 2080 launch day review conclusion was to just go buy a 1080 Ti while you still could, because remember, at that time, there were literally zero RTX games. The first RTX game wouldn't launch for another two months, and because we're not in the business of reviewing promises, the 1080 Ti just made way more sense back then. It was comparatively cheap, too. It's incredible how many generations this card has managed to survive and remain playable, and matching the 2080 really proves that. Finally, in GTA V, the 1080 held a 56 FPS average and was between the 5700 XT and the 3060, this is at 4K. The 1080 Ti continues to impress and outmatches the 4060 Ti. It's a hell of a show from Pascal. Finally, just for fun, here's some power consumption numbers. In a total 100% workload, we have the 1080 Ti at about 280 watts, that has it more power hungry than the 7900 GRE, so if nothing else, cards have definitely gotten way more power efficient over the years in terms of FPS. It's similar to the 4070 Ti non-super. With an overclock, we have the 1080 Ti at 325 watts, and that's another aspect that goaded the card. Its OC headroom was often enormous, with board partners more enabled to expand the total power budget than you'll often find in a VBIOS today. This has it around 7900 XT and 3080 levels. So that's kind of the wrap up. To recap some of the pricing, the 4070 Super, it's like the same price if you ignore inflation. Uh, it's cheaper if you factor it in, something like 470 bucks. The 4070 Ti Super is the same price back then with inflation. And uh, meaning if you spent that amount of money today, and then you got in a time machine went back, you'd be buying a 1080 Ti with roughly the same money. The 7900 GRE, is cheaper ignoring inflation. It's about $431 in 2016. Uh, and then the 7900 XT is similar price with inflation. Now, the inflation numbers are coming from US government data. For the numbers specifically, we compared uh, the launch date for the 1080 Ti, the precise date against December of 2023. They didn't have 2024 data available yet. And uh, as for the accuracy of it, I, I don't know. Ask the US government. It's a little, it's, it's above my head. So, but uh, those are kind of the numbers to consider. Ultimately, if you you feel like your buying power is about the uh, the same as it was then, then you're looking at something like maybe 4070 Ti, 700XE, something in that range. Anyway, the 1080 Ti holds on to its crown as the GOAT. And at this point, it's not gonna let go of it. This card will go down as completely legendary when it eventually gets retired from our benches. But until a point at which it can't really run things anymore, we're gonna keep it in as many charts as we can because it's just, it's fun to continue seeing how well it's holding up. This is genuinely, people occasionally in the comments will ask what cards or what hardware I've enjoyed reviewing the most, what I've most genuinely liked working on uh, in my 15 or so years doing this. And earnestly, the 1080 Ti is probably in my top three things I've ever worked on. It might be number one. Uh, some of that is because it was it was a bit of a formative era for us as an outlet uh, where this specific generation of cards from AMD and NVIDIA was one where we were really starting to learn a lot about the processes and uh, the performance remains impressive for the price. So anyway, if you're looking to buy something new, first of all, uh, depending on what CPU you're running, but if you're on a platform from that era, probably should consider buying into something newer just so you don't uh, sort of hamstring the performance of a new card too much, but 4070 Ti Super, 700 XT, 700 XTX price has actually come down to like 900 to 950 bucks these days. 6950 XT if used, 3080 if used. Those are kind of the starting points. 4070 Super if you're looking to spend a little less but still get a meaningful uplift and uh, some actual RT. It does seem, however, that if you're trying to find what's the next 1080 Ti, <laughs> Doesn't really seem like there is one right now. The 3080 was lined up for it, but couldn't quite take that title. The 4090 is definitely the closest contender, but its price just, it takes away a lot of the power that it would have in terms of that association people would make with something like the 1080 Ti. It's gotta be a combination of the two together that makes something as special as this card was. So anyway, it still plays games. Uh, if you're not into RT or don't care yet, 
And if you can get by on either older titles or 1080p, then I think my personal message for people would be if you don't feel like your 1080 or your 1080 Ti is underperforming for you, don't upgrade. Just wait till the next generation. You stretch it out a little longer, put bigger gaps between those card purchases, and you're stretching your money a little further for other things in life. Uh, of course, if you feel like it's time to upgrade, then there are plenty of options. We've given you the numbers. But this was really fun for us. I love doing this kind of look back at things. And if you're interested in more things like this, go watch our 3DFX Voodoo Revisit. We did it with a modern handmade replica of a Voodoo card. It's an awesome video. Patrick wrote the script for that thing, and uh, that was an awesome piece. We also have an article on GamersNexus.net. If you want to just read it, click on GPUs. Thanks for watching. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to support us directly by grabbing something like one of our mod mats or one of our soldering and project mats. We'll see you next time.